Hi, I'm Chris Wilson from Grinding Gear Games. Welcome to our live stream and thanks so much for joining us today. Our team had a lot of fun putting together Path of Exiles 315 expansion and we've got a lot to share with you. Today's live stream is a busy one. We'll start by revealing the details of this expansion's new Challenge League. Then we'll show you how this expansion is going to dramatically shake up Path of Exile's metagame in a big way. Thirdly, we'll talk about our plans to make Path of Exile more challenging, restoring some of the adrenaline and terror that you may recall from the good old days of closed beta. Next up, we're going to talk about Path of Exile Royale, the 100-player Battle Royale mode that we experimented with back in 2018. We'll be launching a restored and revamped version of Royale today, once our question and answer session with Ziggy D has concluded, and this event will run over the weekend. Anyway, there's a lot to discuss, so let's get started with the trailer for Path of Exile's next expansion. Many centuries ago, our people traveled to this accursed continent. We return to reclaim our lost relics. But Rayclast grips its secrets tightly. We must wrench them from its grasp. You know violence. We know trade. Retrieve our relics and we'll strike a deal. We will follow the path of our forebears to discover their unknown fate. They wait, shrouded in darkness for one who may finally challenge them. Wealth and power will be yours, should you survive our expedition. Alright, I've got a lot to tell you about. Let's start with the Expedition League itself. Long ago, Kalgurin explorers came to Rayclast in the hope of colonizing it. Rayclast did what it does best and they never returned. In the Expedition League, you will meet a group of Kalgurins who have set out on an expedition to investigate the fate of their ancestors and recover special ruined artifacts they left behind. The ancient Kalgurans underestimated the dangers of Rayclast, and this new expedition is no exception. They need your help to protect them from the undead that rise at their expedition sites. As you travel through Rayclast, you'll encounter the Kalgurans at sites they believe their ancestors attempted to settle in the past. By the time you get there, they will have marked the site with signs indicating where chests are buried, holes indicating where their ancestors lie, and will have possibly unearthed some remnants of past Kalguran settlement. Due to the unique nature of Rayclass, the Kalgurans have found that the most effective way to excavate these sites is with explosives. And that's where you come in. You'll place a chain of explosives across the expedition site, carefully planning what each blast is going to unearth. Once you push the plunger, any undead freed by the explosions rise from the ground and the slaughter begins. Some of these fallen Kalgur are more difficult and rewarding than others, and have been indicated with special markers. Once you have defeated the army of undead, you're free to open all of the chests you unearthed and claim your rewards. It's up to you to decide where to place the chain of explosives to maximize your gains. Do you unearth a lot of monsters? Do you unearth more special monsters? Or do you go for the chests and try to avoid combat? The ancient Kalgurin explorers built structures on Rayclast, and you may encounter remnants of these at excavation sites. These remnants have various modifiers on them that, when destroyed, apply to monsters and chests unearthed from that explosion onwards. 
Remnants greatly increase drops, but have some very difficult modifiers like immune to physical damage. You'll need to be very careful with your decision of which remnants to chain your explosives through as they substantially ramp up the difficulty and rewards of the encounters. Speaking of rewards, there's a lot of cool stuff to find. Alongside valuable equipment and currency items are Kalgurin artifacts and logbooks, which we'll talk about soon. The Kalgurin traders have made this expedition to Rayclast in order to recover their ruined artifacts. There are many different types of artifacts, and each of the Kalgurins is interested in a different set of them, with a unique way they want to trade them from you. For this expansion, we really wanted to play with the idea of having NPCs that want to trade with you in different ways. So we have themed their behaviours around the concepts of gambling, bartering, upselling, and exchanging. Let's meet the Kalgurins. Tuyin is a mercurial trader who maintains a positive outlook as long as he can, but if you cross a line, his temper changes quickly. Tuyin offers you items with unreasonably high prices, but he's happy to haggle. You can always buy the item at the price he's offering, but if you offer a lower price, he might accept it, counteroffer, or withdraw the item entirely if he is offended by your lowball. He also occasionally sells currency items, so it's worthwhile keeping some of the artifacts he's looking for on hand just in case you see an opportunity. Grog is an average man pushed into Rayclast's dangers. He's helpful, concerned, and a bit fearful. He is very happy for you to do the fighting so that he can stay safe on the sidelines. He loves making deals and trying to upsell you. If you buy one of the items that Grog offers, he'll try to offer you a more complex deal where he improves the item via crafting. If you accept this deal, he'll try to upsell you again and again until you eventually walk away with your purchase. If you can't afford one of these incremental upgrades, you can leave and come back later with enough ruined artifacts to cover the cost. Because you don't get to supply your own starter item for this process, and have to select an item with promise from the range that he offers, his incremental crafting upgrades are priced rather cheaply. Gwenon is a cynical gambler who claims that luck depends on how hard you believe. So you really need to convince yourself that you're going to get that headhunter. If you don't, it's your fault. Gwenon shows you a set of base types with unknown properties. When you gamble by buying one, you'll receive a random item of that base type back. It could easily be a random magic item that you have no use for, but can sometimes be a valuable rare or unique item. It's probably best to prioritize gambling on base types that are most relevant to your character. Once you have exhausted all the items that interest you, it's possible to use a specific new currency item to re-roll the gamble window to a set of new items of your current level. Sometimes a base type shows up that is a lot more expensive than it would otherwise be, and gambling on this item has a higher expected value than normal. You're taking the risk though that it could still be junk. Danig, Warrior Skald, is the heart of the expedition, its brave leader and lawmaster. Danig is interested in specific types of ruined artifacts and wants to trade these from you for a variety of options, such as currency that lets you reroll vendor inventories, logbooks, or artifacts that other Kalgurin traders are looking for. You can talk to the traders in the wild, in town, or in your hideout. They grant you access to your expedition locker, which is like the Heist Locker, a lockbox for League-specific items, which can be accessed in all three places also. We're adding the affinity system to these lockers. Among the many relics of the ancient Kalgurans you might find at their expedition sites are logbooks. These ancient books chronicle the locations that their ancestors visited in their exploration of Rayclast. A logbook item can be rolled to have a set of explicit mods, like an endgame map. Each location within the logbook has its own implicit mods, as well as a theme that controls what types of remnants can be found there. Talk to Danig in your hideout and give him a logbook you have found to go on an expedition to one of the locations it describes. These are all exotic places that no exiles have ever traveled to before. Just like how a blighted map was one giant blight encounter with no natural monsters, the expedition you go on from a logbook is one giant expedition. Expeditions from logbooks are not only different because of their large size, but because there are special objects that you can interact with using explosives. For example, trees that contain monsters or items, passageways that reveal chests or bosses, and so on. Speaking of bosses, there are some formidable ones for you to seek out, and a set of valuable new unique items and base types that can only come from expedition content. The Kalgurim people are not from Rayclast, so the items do not have the same defensive properties that ours do. Instead of armor, evasion, and energy shield, they have ward. This new base type is a pair of boots that grants ward and can get mods that improve it. 
The way that Ward works is that you have a certain amount of it, and that amount is fully deducted from the first incoming hit that you receive. Your ward is then disabled, and takes 5 seconds to re-enable. At that point, the next hit you receive is substantially mitigated in the same way. It's quite a different style of defensive property, and works very well in conjunction with systems like evasion, block, or dodge. As the undead enemies you unearth in expedition encounters are fallen Kalgoran explorers, they also have a ward rather than traditional defenses. This unique helmet allows you to go all in with ward as a defensive option for your character. It causes all increases to energy shield to affect your ward instead, grants you a bunch of ward and helps it recover faster. This other unique helmet is also on a new base type that grants ward instead of other defense types, but its properties don't interact with ward. Instead, it prevents you from dealing critical strikes and grants you Battle Mage, which adds spell damage equal to the damage of your main hand weapon. The new base types and uniques I showed you here are just some of the ones you'll be able to discover when you play next week. So that's the Expedition League. Each of the developers I've spoken to has liked a different aspect of it, but I have really personally been enjoying the different trade mechanics offered by the Kalgoran NPCs. The Gamble Window takes me back 20 years on a nostalgic trip, and Tuyan's haggling manages to capture the intense feeling I get when negotiating. And anyone who really knows me knows how much I love negotiating. This expansion also promises to massively shake up the Path of Exile metagame. And we're doing that by introducing new gems. Lots and lots of new gems. For quite a while now, the way we have approached new skills in Path of Exile expansions is to make a bunch of gems themed around an entirely new build or dramatically augmenting a few existing builds. The Blood skills in the Ultimatum expansion are a good example of this. While this approach is great in terms of creating interesting new builds, it doesn't always affect every character game-wide. In order to achieve this big metagame shakeup, we've come up with a crazy idea for the Expedition expansion. Adding a gigantic pile of new gems at once, spread among as many different playstyles as possible. Each of these gems can of course be used by many different classes, but we use the list of 19 Ascendancy classes for inspiration when planning these gems. Our goal here is that regardless of which build you're playing, there will be new gems that you can add to your character. Let's go through the 19 new skill and support gems. The Earthbreaker support gem can be linked to any slam skill. Upon use, it summons an ancestor totem that uses that slam on your behalf. In this example, we've created a build that summons multiple ancestor totems that each wield tectonic slam. As you can see, this build covers a large area in fiery death while you get to stay out of harm's way. This is a powerful option for Chieftains in particular due to the various totem bonuses available on their Ascendancy passive tree. Adept players will also be wondering if the Earthbreaker support allows you to create leap slamming totems, and the answer is absolutely. As with other Ancestor totems, the Earthbreaker support also provides a buff to you, granting some increased area of effect with melee skills. Rage Vortex provides a new way to consume your rage, unleashing a whirling vortex that rapidly hits enemies within its range. It gains damage and area of effect based on how much rage was sacrificed. The vortex slows down when enemies survive being hit by it, causing it to deal intense damage to tough targets. While you can only have one Rage Vortex active at a time, characters such as Berserkers who are able to generate a lot of rage quickly will find it a great way to augment their damage output. Bone Shatter strikes your enemies with a forceful blow. If an enemy is stunned by this attack, a powerful shockwave is released. The area of effect of the shockwave is determined by the duration of the stun you inflicted. Each time you use Bone Shatter against an enemy, you take physical damage yourself and gain a trauma stack. The more stacks you have, the more damage Bone Shatter will deal to both you and your enemies. This self-damage mechanic makes the Juggernaut the ideal class for the skill because they have easy access to lots of armor to mitigate the downside. Also, the Juggernaut has Ascendancy passives that grant increased stun duration which help make sure the Shockwave is as large as possible. Defiance Banner is a new purely defensive banner skill. While you carry the Defiance Banner, it increases the armor and evasion of nearby allies while reducing the critical strike chance of nearby enemies. It also gains stages while carried near enemies and can be placed on the ground to enhance its effects. When the Defiance Banner is placed, it inflicts a taunt on enemies for a duration based on the number of stages the banner had accumulated while it was carried. Enemies affected by this taunt also deal less damage to all targets. The next new skill is Shield Crush, which swipes your shield towards enemies and sends out forceful waves of damage based on the stats of your shield. 
These waves can shotgun enemies with up to two hits at once. So while Shield Crush is great against groups, it's also effective against single targets and can be used alongside Shield Charge and Spectral Shield Throw. We've improved both of these skills so that the overall aggressive shield build is more powerful. The new Behead support gem can only support strike skills and is basically like a mini headhunter. When a supported strike kills a rare enemy, you'll steal one of its modifiers. Obviously this gem can't be as crazy as the full headhunter experience, so it comes with some restrictions. Stolen modifiers can persist for 20 seconds and slaying another rare enemy will replace the modifier you have active. The Behead support gem also grants you more damage against enemies on low life. In conjunction with the Slayer's Bane of Legends Ascendancy passive, this bonus really embraces the execution theme of the Behead support. Storm Rain is a new bow skill that fires arrows that stick into the ground. These arrows periodically pulse with lightning damage that arcs to nearby arrows. This skill works very well with multiple projectiles because you can quickly set up a large patch of lightning death. Existing Ballista skills in Path of Exile pick their own targets, like sentry guns do. They'll start shooting immediately and will generally target the closest enemies. While this behavior is usually great, sometimes you want fine control over what your ballistas will fire at. The focused ballista support gem causes your ballistas to pick the same targets as you, and they will only fire when you fire your own ranged weapon. It also makes the ballistas fire a lot faster than they otherwise would. This support gem allows you to effectively focus fire on specific enemies such as bosses. Explosive Concoction is quite a novel skill. It introduces several new concepts that haven't been explored with skills before. Here you can see the Pathfinder throwing an explosive projectile at monsters. Firstly, you may notice that the Pathfinder isn't holding any weapons. This is because Explosive Concoction is the very first ranged skill that can and must be used unarmed. It's also the first skill that directly interacts with the benefits provided by your flasks. When you throw your Explosive Concoction onto a targeted area, it deals fire damage and uses available charges from your Ruby, Sapphire and Topaz flasks to grant bonuses based on what flask charges were used. The skill still works even if you don't have the appropriate flasks or charges to consume, but correctly managing your flask setup can greatly enhance the power of this skill. What we really love about this gem is that it brings to life the idea of throwing your flasks at enemies and having them explode. In conjunction with the flask-focused benefits provided by the Pathfinder's Ascendancy passive skills, we're really excited to see what new playstyles are enabled by this gem. This is the Ambush skill. It teleports you up to an enemy, blinds them, and exerts your next one-handed melee attack. This exerted attack has a high critical strike chance and multiplier. In addition to this helping your assassinations, you can also use Ambush to quickly re-engage targets after dashing away. Voltaxic Burst grants a buff that counts down to zero, triggering a burst of lightning damage around you with a portion of that damage converted to Chaos Damage. Enemies slain by your Voltaxic Burst will also explode, dealing Chaos Damage around them based on their maximum life. You can stack up many Voltaxic Bursts on yourself at the same time. Consider using Duration Modifiers to modify the timing of the explosion so that you can cast the skill from safety and then move into a strategic position before it explodes. When you use Blade Trap, you throw out a mechanical device with two copies of your weapon attached. These blades spin rapidly in a circle a set number of times, dealing damage to anything they pass through. When dual wielding, the trap rotates faster but deals damage based on both weapons. Because it's a trap, Blade Trap behaves a little differently to other attack skills by operating independently of your attack speed. This means you'll have some interesting itemization choices to make in focusing more on damage modifiers rather than the typical focus of maximizing attack speed. Summon Reaper creates a single powerful minion that uses fast melee physical attacks which cause bleeding. While the Reaper is active, you can use the skill again to direct the Reaper to a specific location, dealing a powerful attack along its path. The Reaper wants to be your only minion. It reduces the life and damage of your other minions, and will consume them to heal itself and gain damage and speed buffs. When designing this new skill for the Necromancer, we wanted to explore the idea of having a single ultimate minion. While there were ways to somewhat achieve this before, the Reaper is quite different in its abilities and interactions with other minions. It also feels much more active and directly under your control. One quick note though, the Reaper will absolutely eat your animated guardian if you're not careful. Forbidden Rite is a powerful new spell that fires an exploding chaos projectile at a targeted area. It also targets a selection of enemies in an area around the player's location and fires projectiles at them too. 
But be careful, Forbidden Right also inflicts damage on you when cast. If you can find a clever way to mitigate this harmful downside, you'll have devastating and widespread damage at your fingertips. The Eye of Winter is a large projectile that fires out a barrage of cold projectiles in a spiral formation as it travels. When it reaches its maximum distance or collides with the terrain, it explodes, firing out even more projectiles in a spiral. This type of skill is one we've been wanting to bring to Path of Exile for a long time, and we felt that this new collection of skills was the perfect place to showcase it. This Inquisitor is using the new Battle Mage's Cry skill, which taunts nearby enemies and exerts your subsequent attacks, causing them to trigger a linked spell on your next melee hit. Here you can see the player taunting enemies with Battle Mage's Cry and using Consecrated Path to teleport to enemies. The slam is exerted, triggering Firestorm to rain down on those enemies. In order to assist with scaling both attack and spell damage, the buff this Warcry provides lets your spell damage apply to your attacks. This property is usually only available on wands and certain unique items. Mana Bond is a somewhat unusual gem in that its source of power relies on your current mana. Upon use, it creates a rune that explodes at a location you're targeting. This explosion can either deal more damage or cover a larger area depending on the state of your mana. The more mana that's missing from your mana pool, the more damage Mana Bond will deal as it converts a percentage of your missing mana into added lightning damage. The more full your mana pool is, the more area the explosion will cover. This means that being adept at managing your mana pool becomes highly advantageous. For example, having slightly higher mana while clearing a map provides greater clear speed, but when fighting tougher enemies, having a lower current mana amount is better. Absolution has been designed for Guardians as a spell version of Dominating Blow. Absolution deals a damaging shockwave in a targeted area. When it kills an enemy, it summons a Sentinel of Absolution which also deals damage by casting Absolution itself. The Sentinels also periodically cast a larger version of Absolution on the cooldown. While the Sentinels version of Absolution can't summon even more minions, they are a powerful army to fight against. Spectral Helix throws a spectral copy of your melee weapon which spirals outwards from you, dealing damage to any enemies it passes through. The design of the skill achieves what we always wanted Vile Spectral Throw to be. We thought it was a really fun idea for a skill, but because of the limitations caused by the soul gathering requirements of Vile skills, it wasn't possible to use Vile Spectral Throw as a primary skill. Now that Spectral Helix can live up to this purpose, we've reworked Vile Spectral Throw, which we'll reveal closer to release. One of the other issues that Vile Spectral Throw had was that it didn't work very well in indoors areas. However, Spectral Helix improves upon this as the projectiles that spiral outwards can also bounce off of walls and proceed to hit enemies, rather than simply disappearing upon collision. Over the last few years, Path of Exile has really suffered from player power creep. As a consequence of trying to make compelling content, each expansion we release either gives players more axes on which to improve their character, more effective skills to use, or ways to craft better and more powerful items. Measuring from closed beta to now, this expedition expansion is our 30th Path of Exile release. The amount of power creep varies per release, of course, with systems like Ascendancy classes providing, what, like 20, 30, 40% power creep at once? Like with Compound Interest, it would only take 8% more player power per expansion from new items, crafting, character systems, item acquisition opportunities, and new skills for player power to grow tenfold since the game has been out. And tenfold is roughly what we measure the increase in player power to be. We may nerf the most out-of-hand cases every launch, but we're only reducing them back down to close to the new baseline. The average Path of Exile character gets more and more powerful. While we do occasionally add new endgame challenges that are appropriate for the current power level of top characters, the rest of the game just becomes relatively easier and easier. Some games handle this by just endlessly and exponentially scaling monster life and damage to counteract player power growth. Eventually, the numbers get too large and we need to crunch them all down again. This is a really cheap approach, and makes the game feel like a treadmill where the developers are just turning a knob as they hand you new power, keeping you in the same place forever. We don't want to treat Path of Exile like that, and hence our solutions are more complicated. At the same time, one of the issues is that players will always pick the most powerful way of interacting with any game system, even when that's not actually fun to play. This leads to behaviors like Flask Piano, or the way that everyone just picks support gems that basically add pure damage. As game designers, it is our responsibility to make sure that the most powerful behaviors are also the most fun to engage with. 
With that in mind, the balance changes that we are making in Expedition are far-reaching and are going to affect almost all characters. Our goal is not to just nerf specific builds, but to improve the game, its challenge, and to make sure that people want to pick fun build choices. Anyone who played Path of Exile during its closed beta nine years ago can attest to how challenging the campaign was to play through. Early monsters were dangerous and terrifying, able to kill a character in a few seconds of inattention. Players feared going into the ship graveyard cave because of the flicker strike ghosts. They were careful around rowers because a couple of unlucky charges could outright kill them. Trying to kill a Goatman Shaman while he had Molten Shell up was a pretty terrible idea. Nowadays, however, the game is a lot easier. We added level 2 and 4 support gems without increasing the difficulty of the game to compensate at all. Modern league mechanics shower the player in rare items from early levels, and we didn't make the game any harder in response. In fact, it's very interesting to compare the difficulty of league content with that of the base game. For a few years now, we've been shipping difficult leagues where monster life and damage values are a lot higher than the regular monsters that players fight between those league encounters. Players enjoy league content because it's challenging. They also told us they really enjoyed the Path of Exile 2 demo at ExileCon, and it was tuned to be almost punitive in terms of difficulty. One thing we learned from building that demo was that it's okay for some monsters to be able to run 20 to 40% faster than the player. In Path of Exile 1's first act, there isn't a single monster that moves faster than the player's default movement speed. We are rebalancing the campaign to be challenging. So far, we have focused mostly on Act 1, but with each coming expansion, we'll be extending this further. Our plan is that within a year or so, we'll have reviewed or touched every single monster in the game. While this additional challenge probably won't stop our most skilled players easily dominating the campaign or running through it to get to maps quickly, it will mean that players who engage with the content will find a consistent difficulty level between League content and regular content. It's worth noting that the behavioral and balance changes to monsters will definitely affect their map versions. For quite some time, Path of Exile players and developers have been keen for a big rework to its Flask system. In the endgame, Flasks grant really powerful buffs for a number of seconds after use, and these buffs allow the player to kill monsters quickly, filling the Flasks up so they can be used as soon as they run out. With five such Flasks equipped, the correct behavior was to spam the 1-5 to five keys repeatedly to keep all the Flasks constantly up without any downsides. This Flask piano playstyle was popular enough that players were improvising devices to hit all of those keys at once. Spamming the same set of keys repeatedly to get a powerful set of buffs that rival the power you get from your entire set of equipped items is not a fun game mechanic. It's unbalanced and certainly isn't nice on your wrist. It prevents us from balancing the game well for players who aren't smashing their keyboard constantly and seriously restricts the design space we can use on flasks. In addition, certain unique flasks completely outclass other ones in terms of raw damage output. It was pretty clear to us that Path of Exile would be a lot better if we did some serious work on flasks to make sure that their incentives were aligned with fun rather than with spamming blindly. Most utility flasks and unique flasks have been rebalanced. Expect a lot less permanent power from flasks. Flasks that provide raw defense or raw power are the ones with the biggest nerfs. Some flasks have been selectively buffed a bit if they were underpowered or less popular. In the Expedition expansion, there are now three ways that you can use flasks. You can either continue to use the rebalanced ones the traditional way, or you can apply one of the two new types of currency items to your flasks. The Instilling Orb and Enkindling Orb drop as part of the regular drop pool from regular monsters and chests. The Instilling Orb will cause a flask to be used automatically upon a specific condition being met. For example, when its charges become full or when you become affected by Ignite. This means that in the cases where you would previously want to time a specific flask usage, you can now rely on it happening automatically, with the only trade-off being that it may consume charges that you otherwise wouldn't intend it to. There are a variety of different conditions, and a random one is enchanted onto your flask, overwriting the others each time you use an instilling orb on it. The enkindling orb prevents utility flasks from gaining charges while active, but provides a big boost to their effect, duration, or various ways they interact with their charges. There are various different types of boosts, so you can use more orbs to reroll for the one that you want. When a flask removes a curse, it no longer applies a period of immunity to curses. Flasks that remove ailments now only provide a period of immunity to that ailment if they actually removed it. So if you get ignited, use a dowsing flask to remove the ignite and to gain immunity for a while. You can't spam the flask before you're ignited to be permanently immune. If you want permanent mitigation of ailments, there are other options for your build. Note that we have rebalanced ailment mitigation in general, so there aren't a few options that completely outclass the rest. 
Monster density in Path of Exile gets a lot higher as you play through the game. When we initially balanced Blast Charge Generation a decade ago, we did not anticipate the levels of monster density we would reach by 2021. Monsters in Acts 6 through 10 now generate fewer flash charges, and monsters in maps generate even fewer still. So now there's a lot more strategy involved with flask use. Flasks don't gain as many charges, so are a little harder to constantly spam, and aren't designed to provide such a powerful slew of permanent buffs. But you can control which provide larger than normal effects, and which are triggered automatically as part of your build. We have reworked existing flasks, such as Basalt and Aquamarine flasks, and have introduced new Corundum and Gold flasks. For a while now, we have been concerned with a power gap between support gems. There are gems that grant huge multiplicative damage bonuses, and there are gems that do a bunch of stuff you don't really care about. When you're building a character, by far the correct choice is just to stack on all the multiplicative damage bonuses and ignore all the interesting utility support gems, because their opportunity cost is just too high. We are reducing the damage bonuses on the support gems that are clearly just about huge damage boosts, and trying to give them impactful and appropriate downsides. For example, the Controlled Destruction support gem now penalizes critical strikes multiplicatively. Overall, this works out to a total of somewhere around 20%, potentially as high as 40% damage reduction for a character using a fully six-linked skill with entirely damaged support gems. There's much less impact for characters that use utility support gems or those who didn't have a six-link setup. This achieves two goals for us. Firstly, the gap between good and bad support gems has been narrowed, creating more interesting build opportunities. Secondly, player damage output in the endgame is reduced, which is a goal for this balance pass. As I mentioned, we want to iteratively restore challenge to Path of Exile. It's worth clarifying that we haven't buffed unused utility support gems as part of this balance pass. It's fully intentional that it's a reduction of power for the most damaging ones. When we're designing skills for Path of Exile, the mana cost of the skill is a mechanism to allow us to have larger impactful effects. Bigger skills should cost more mana to cast. Unfortunately, this entire mechanism is currently bypassed by triggering skills as this skips their mana cost. This basically means that we can't design really powerful spells. In 315, triggering skills through support gems will require paying their mana cost. In fact, sometimes it now costs more than casting the gem by hand. Thankfully though, this isn't very hard with well-constructed characters. Certain support gems that were originally disabled from supporting triggered skills, like Arcane Surge, can now be used to support them. Builds that use triggered skills are some of the most interesting characters in Path of Exile, and they are often the best representation of the craziness that our character customization system allows. We're confident that they are just as powerful as before, but we now have more interesting design space to explore with future skills. Now let's talk about movement skills. As you know, most interaction with monster behavior is essentially bypassed if you're using an extremely effective movement skill. This is okay if you're specialized deeply into customizing that skill, but it's currently the default state for any character if you use Flame Dash, Smoke Mine, or Dash without any further investment. These skills have been rebalanced to be more in line with other movement skills. These are not huge numeric nerfs, but do mean that there is scope for improving the performance of the skills by specializing around them. There are many other balance changes in 315, which you can read about in the Balance Manifesto and patch notes next week. To be honest, there are a lot of nerfs here. We completely understand that this level of change will make some people nervous, but it's time we start actively combating power creep and fixing game systems that haven't been working the way we intended them to. I think that the metagame of Expedition is going to be fascinating. The reduction of overall player power, combined with all of the opportunities from the new skills and flask system changes, should create entirely new sets of builds that we haven't previously seen. You guys are always surprising us with what you do, and we can't wait to see what you come up with here. So back in early 2018, there was a trend where every online game was releasing a Battle Royale mode and getting a lot of good press in the process. We had a running joke in the office that our fast development speed meant that we could probably add a Battle Royale mode to Path of Exile in one day of development. As April Fool's Day approached, we tried to do exactly that. We pulled a few developers together and asked them to spend no more than one workday each on their contributions to this new mode. On April 1st, 2018, we launched Path of Exile Royale, Yeah, buddy! <laughs> it was a quick and dirty job, so we only left the game mode turned on for a couple of days. It went pretty well, considering it had no custom balance whatsoever. Oh my god, I'm getting destroyed! <laughs> After April 1st, we turned the mode off and forgot all about it. 
but the community did not forget. In fact, they've been quite keen to remember it constantly and to urge us to bring it back. But that wouldn't be easy, as to actually make it a decent experience would require a lot of custom balance, playtesting, and feature implementation work. A few months ago, we decided to do exactly that. Path of Exile Royale will return today. In fact, immediately after the QA section of this livestream. We're going to run it for the weekend as a test, and then turn it on every weekend for a while, starting the week after Expedition's launch. We'll patch it between weekends with balance tweaks, and if it's popular over the long term, new features. We have no idea what the long-term viability of this game mode is going to be like, so we'll run it for this league and then assess where things stand. Our initial version of Royale from 2018 used Path of Exile's default passive skill tree, which didn't have interesting options for characters that rarely got to level 10. It also used all of our skill gems and unique items as is, where many of the interesting ones were way too high level for these super low level characters to ever find. We've made a completely new Royale-specific passive skill tree that has everything you need to quickly adapt your character for high-speed PvP combat. It features approximately 90 new custom notable passives, a special new left-aligned window so you can stay aware of your surroundings while allocating skills, and you gain two passive skill points per level. You're also able to allocate passive skills from any of the tree starting locations, regardless of which character class you picked. We have created low-level versions of around 50 iconic skill gems, 20 support gems, and over 70 unique items. These royalified items are appropriate for low-level play and include quite a few things that are usually only available at substantially higher character levels in the core game. The whole island has been improved. We've made the terrain more varied and interesting so that the fights feel different depending on where they take place. You'll encounter flask troves which provide charges for your flasks. These troves periodically replenish themselves, so expect a lot of combat to occur around them. There are many other small improvements you'll notice when you play Royale, such as an improved spectator mode, improved leaderboard, and ability to pillage items from players through a special interface rather than having them clutter the ground. You don't need to delete and remake your character for each game, as you could just reuse your old one which is automatically reset to level 1. Your prize for coming first on a Royale event is this new Roa Dinner hideout decoration. It's a bit like a challenge league totem as it grows more impressive as you win more events. Royale is available to play today, as soon as our Q&A session concludes in about 45 minutes. So patch your Path of Exile client, and when we're done with the Q&A, log in and click to join the Royale event at the bottom right of the screen. For more detailed information on how the mode works, check out the news post we just made on pathofexile.com. We'll be running the event from today over the weekend. If you don't get a chance to play Royale over the next few days, we'll run it again every weekend other than Expedition's launch weekend for the next few months. Please check it out and let us know your feedback. Keep an eye on our news over the next week as we reveal the finer details of what's coming in Expedition, including the full patch notes on Tuesday, US time. We'll move on to the Q&A shortly to answer your burning questions, but first, let's have a look at the new supporter packs that are available right now to celebrate the launch of Expedition and help fund ongoing development of Path of Exile, Path of Exile 2, and special modes like Royale. The Soul Keeper and Aesir supporter packs come with masses of points to spend in the store, social frames, forum titles and badges, a download of the digital soundtrack, and of course, exclusive cosmetic microtransactions like armor sets and weapon skins. The Soul Keeper series comes with an exclusive pet, and the Aesir series an exclusive set of wings. On top of the traditional small and medium-sized supporter packs that are consistent with ones we've released in the past, we're also adding an optional new third tier for each series. This new tier includes an exclusive apparition portal effect and a slightly better ratio of points per dollar spent. The introduction of these new packs should give you more options for what combination of each pack series you purchase. Like always, it's possible to upgrade between pack tiers within each series. Thank you so much for your support. Purchases of these supporter packs are the only thing that fund the ongoing development of Path of Exile, as well as expansions like Expedition and Path of Exile Royale. The reveals we showed you today are already live on YouTube for you to link to your friends in case they miss the live stream. Please do so. We'd love to have as many of you as possible joining our expedition next week. It's time for the Q&A. If you have any questions from what we've shown you today, please get them ready because I'm about to be joined by Ziggy D as we answer your questions from Twitch chat. And after that, see you in Royale.